Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all doing well and keeping well and safe during COVID. The Marie Keating Foundation would like to extend a very warm welcome to you all um, to our first ever six week webinar series, obviously converted to webinar um, from our face to face uh, series and seminars we would have run previously. A huge learning curve, but we feel like we've adapted to, to it very well, um, as well as many of our colleagues and friends and yourselves too, of course. Um, so we, uh, we would love um, to, uh, you, for you to use this as an opportunity um, when you hear expert speakers uh, to make an action plan for yourself week on week. Now we have Avian speaking about keeping a healthy weight and diet today. So maybe this is an opportunity for you to actually think about something like the amount of fruit you would eat um, and maybe keeping um, an action plan for the next uh, series of six weeks. My name is Helen Forrestal. I'm the Director of Nursing Services. Um, so I would like to, uh, um, I suppose, just go through some housekeeping rules to start with. It's a very different environment we're in. You're all in your own homes and hopefully very comfortable. So make sure you can see your screen and that you can hear, hear us. Um, uh, make sure you're sitting comfortably and of course, get up and move around as you need to. We have Jennifer Sinnerman, our Senior Communications Manager in the background. Um, and Jennifer is our IT support for today and is managing um, all technology, thankfully. Um, now, as an attendee, uh, you will be able to see and hear us, um, but you will not be able to use your video or speak. Uh, there is a question and answer session at the end of Avian Speak. Um, so if you look at the bottom of your panel, um, you will see a Q&A uh, button that you can press. This session will be moderated by our senior oncology nurse, Bernie Carter. We would love you to participate in the Q&A session, um, and it's really important for you to do that. Um, you can participate anonymously, or you can put your name in. It is entirely up to yourself, whichever you would prefer. So when you find your Q&A button, you press on that, click on that, um, and type in your question, but do make sure you hit the return or enter key so that uh, we actually receive the questions here with us. Keep an eye on the questions that are being asked as you go through, um, um, because there may be questions that you would like to ask yourself. You will see an icon like the like icon on Facebook, and if you click that, it will actually generate the question to the top of the page. So you're sure that it can be answered. Um, the webinar itself will be recorded um, and that will be available for all who registered next week. I'd also like to give you a flavor for, for those in the audience as we're not able to network today. So our colleagues who have committed to the sponsorship of this program, Rosh, we would like to thank you very much for your commitment. Our Marie Keating Foundation nurses and staff, and Liz, our CEO. Um, those who have attended our Survive and Thrive six week programs in the past at a, on a face to face um, may well be present in the audience. And our ladies with metastatic breast cancer, members of our positive living group and the wider community. So thank you for, for tuning in. Our healthcare professionals, um, those who can make it, um, and huge respect goes to those who are working on the front line. Um, our condolences also to those families who have lost patients to COVID, people to COVID, um, and who actually have recovered from COVID. And it was interesting to hear on the news last night that 78% of people have recovered from COVID. So something positive coming out of all the bad news. Um, and also to you, women and men in Ireland who have been affected by cancer, um, who understand what it is like um, to uh, go through this journey. Um, so this morning um, uh, we have Dr. Avian, or Avian Bannon, sorry, our dietitian. Um, we also have a panel of experts throughout the six weeks. So just to give you a flavor of what will be happening over the next six weeks. Um, we have on week two, we have Dr. Laurie McDermott, who will talk to you about keeping physically active at home. Um, Laurie works for, with the Exwell Medical uh, Clinic. We have Bridge Leddy on week three to talk to you about making sure you're getting enough sleep. Uh, we have Dr. Eddie Murphy on week four, talking about looking after your mental health, and this will be an interactive session. 
On week five, we have um, a session on manag managing stress and anxiety by Professor Michaela Higgins from the Matter Hospital. And finally, on week six, we will close off our sessions by managing the side effects of treatment, particularly fatigue um, and some mindfulness. Um, so here are our panelists, and we're delighted um, and honored to have um, Avine with us this morning. Um, Avine uh, is a dietitian born in Dublin and practiced widely in hospitals around Ireland and the UK and uh, was instrumental in setting up the Dublin Nutrition Centre in 2003. She graduated from Trinity College with a BSc honours in Human Nutrition and Dietetics and completed a business diploma in Smurfit Business School. She's also a current member of the Irish Nutrition and Dietetic Institute um, and trained in the low FODMAP diet and has completed level two behavior change training. Since, since qualifying, Aileen has gained a wide range of experience in various different medical fields and has provided nutrition services to many health institutions. Um, Aileen has a keen interest in health promotion and nutrition education. She regularly gives talks and presentations to companies at, at health and well-being seminars and provides regular nutrition consultancy for food companies. So Aileen, we're delighted to have you here uh, today um, and I'm just going to allow you to open up your screen now. Thank you very much, Aileen. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm delighted to, I need you to stop sharing first, Helen. Hang on a second. There you go. Um, so I'm delighted to be here this morning. I think uh, this concept of doing webinars is kind of going to be our new going forward for a while. I think it works quite well and it might even be something that people might prefer going forward because uh, they get to have kind of um, enjoy the information from the comfort of their homes. When it comes to nutrition, and particularly in, our, in all of our health, but also particularly in cancer health, there is so much information out there. It can really be really overwhelming, I think, for people. Um, I know myself, I see many things and different health messages over the years. So I'm working as a dietitian now for over 20 years. And I have had the joy of living through all the different kind of health messages, the main ones that have come out over the years. So, for example, one in particular, you know, I would have been brought up in the low fat era where fat was the big evil and everything was low fat. And then, you know, it became the kind of carbs. We should be all avoiding carbs. We shouldn't be eating carbohydrates. Then sugar and the word toxic with sugar became very, very prevalent. Um, and then more recently, it was like, actually, fat's OK. We, we can eat fat. And then even like more recently, it's like we can't eat meat. And if you look at the different mess messages that we've had over the last 20, 30 years, um, we're left with nothing. Now, what these messages have highlighted for us is that, you know, yes, we were eating too much of some of these certain foods and we just need to work towards getting the balance of them. OK, with the kind of I mean, there's many benefits to social media and our kind of more connectivity world, which we're experiencing right now but there can be when it comes to health particularly nutrition it can be really really overwhelming and um, one thing a real dietitian mantra is that we always say there's no such thing as a good or bad food only a good or bad diet whereas a lot of messages out there will be this is, is this good for me is this bad for me it has to be kind of one or the other it's very black and white and um, a lot of people with the best of intentions, but without maybe the, the kind of knowledge base will give advice on nutrition or what we should do and what they think is best. And really, I think the key thing is trying not to overthink it. Um, with nutrition, we know that, you know, when you say like people are gonna like, I'm gonna boost my immune system. You can't really boost your immune system with food, but what you can do is support your immune system through food. So what we wanna help people do is get the best knowledge they can about the food and look at the food as a whole and not kind of pinpoint too much in one particular nutrient, if that makes any sense. Like nutrition is important from a point of view of it can be important during treatment, it can help speed up recovery, it can help with wound healing, it can support your immune system, help manage fatigue. Like it is an important part of kind of people either going through treatment or post-treatment during recovery. But it is one thing that you know, we don't have to be 100% perfect with our diet. We like the kind of 80-20 rule, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, with food, some of you may have heard of or may not have heard of an expression called the food matrix. And this is basically where we talk about like no one single food or food component can protect you. It's a combination of how foods work together. So I'll give you an example. 
we know that if somebody, if I give somebody a calcium supplement in a tablet form of 700 milligrams, and I give them that in the form of milk, 700 milligrams of calcium, they will absorb more from the milk than they will from the tablet. And that's purely because in the milk there's also a protein which helps the body absorb calcium. So that's called the food matrix, it's where the foods, the nutrients work as a whole together. And that's why we'll talk about supplements and how they can complement a diet, but that they're, they don't replace the entire food, if that makes sense. So there is different needs. And for people watching this morning, you will be at a different point and we'll try and cover as much as we can. And please, please ask as many questions as are appropriate to you. But during treatment, quite often, you might need more calories. You know, you might have digestive changes. That would be very, very common to maybe experiencing. It could be kind of frequency going to the bathroom. It could be having constipation, bloating, wind, discomfort. Um, you can have appetite changes, taste changes, nausea, fatigue or you may have unwanted weight gain. So like different things can happen to people during treatment. And really then when you're kind of in a, in a surviving kind of your recovery phase, that's when you want to focus on getting to the healthy weight, keeping active and healthy eating. During treatment, you need to do what suits your body at that time. So protein is something that is hugely important for everybody, irrespective of what phase you're at and in terms of helping us maintain, I suppose, a healthy physique and a healthy immune system as well. What a lot of people don't realise, and in fairness, we didn't realise ourselves until about 10 years ago, was that you can only absorb a certain amount of protein at one time. Now, when I'm referring to protein here, I'm talking about our animal proteins, you know, like fish, chicken, meat, eggs, dairy, I'm also talking about beans, pulses, lentils, tempeh, tofu, corn, like the whole family of protein foods. And what we know is um, most of us tend to eat the bulk of our protein at our main meal. Okay, so if we look at this slide here, you'll see that what we know is we tend to basically get a maximum uh, protein synthesis or muscle synthesis at about 30 grams of protein. So having more than 30 grams of protein in one sitting is of no benefit. Okay, so say for example, if you've had maybe some tea and toast for breakfast, that would be a very low protein meal. You've maybe had some vegetable soup and brown bread at lunch, again, a low protein meal. But then in the evening time, you've had um, um, spaghetti bolognese. Okay, so you'll have had a high protein kind of a, you know, a meal that has quite a bit of protein. Even though if we count up how much protein you've had in the day, it would look a bit like it's enough grams because it's been spread unevenly your body won't have gotten the chance to absorb and utilize all that protein. I hope that makes sense. So protein is quite a unique um, nutrient in that we cannot store it. So we have to have it every day. And every day our muscles are working. Okay, so even when we're cocooning at home and we're walking around the house and we're not getting out as much, our muscles are still working 24 seven. And they will lose a little bit of, we lose a little bit of muscle mass every day. And the only way to replenish it is by having protein in the diet. So it's hugely important that we include it in our daily diet, but we want to look at the timing of it as well. So this is what we would call an optimal protein diet, okay? So we're not, it's not a high protein diet, it's optimal. Now you don't have to have, I've just done the slide here to kind of make it more visual, 30 grams of protein at each meal, but you don't need to have that amount. But you want to make sure you're including protein at each meal, okay? So for example, at breakfast time, that might be including you know, uh, a milk in your cereal, or it could be having yogurt, or it could be having egg. It could be adding nuts and seeds to your, to your porridge or your granola, but it's ensuring that there's protein in there. At lunchtime, if you were having, for example, a vegetable soup, it might be adding some lentils or beans to that soup, or you have chicken breast left over from the night beforehand, you might add some of that into the soup to add the protein. And in the evening time, again, ensuring that you're having your protein at every meal, be it a fish, a meat, a poultry, a bean, or a pulse, whichever your choice is, but that there's always, always protein at each meal. When our appetites aren't great sometimes, or we don't feel, you know, we don't really know what we want, um, we tend to go more for kind of something, we want carbs or kind of plainer foods. So if your appetite isn't 100%, it's particularly important to really focus that you are having protein at each meal. So what I would say to people sometimes is just when you go to your meal time, think what protein am I going to have? Um, one thing, milk, and I'm sure people may have questions about milk. The one concern we have with some of the plant milks, like for example, almond, oat, or um, 
coconut milk or rice milk, any of those milks, they have no protein in them. They're really, really low in protein. So if you are using a plant milk with your breakfast, you're going to miss out on the protein and also not get as much absorption of calcium. If you don't want to have cow's milk, that's fine, but just you need to add protein to that meal, which it could be in the form of maybe nuts or seeds or something like that. Okay, so protein is hugely important. To give you an idea of what 30 grams of protein more or less looks like, it usually is about a hundred, roughly about 100 grams of a meat or about 120 grams roughly of a fish will give you 30 grams of protein. So if you're buying a packet of something, you can just get a rough gauge of more or less what it is. There's about 100 to 120 grams of a meat, a fish or a poultry. Um, when it comes to beans and pulses, usually like about 80, kind of 100 grams of lentils will give you between 8 and 10 grams of protein. Okay. Um, an egg will decide, it depends on the size of the egg, but on average it will be maybe six, sometimes eight grams of protein. So it's just kind of looking at elements like that. A yogurt, a natural yogurt will give you maybe roughly about four grams for a pot, whereas a Greek yogurt is usually about 10% protein. So with the the almonds, you know, you don't have to have a lot of the food. It just needs to be evenly spread. Oops, sorry, just hit my finger. Um, the next kind of the two keys to healthy eating, and I would say this all the time to people, are getting the balance of protein and fiber right. If your protein intake, if you have optimal protein, you're taking care of muscle maintenance and repair. And if you have good fiber, basically what we know is when people have a higher, the higher their fiber intake, the lower their sugar. It just happens. And basically when we see people have a high sugar, it's low fiber. So they kind of inter into kind of um, interplay between each other. Um, what you will notice is your fiber tolerance can change, not always, but it can change during treatment or post-treatment or even the stress of it. I mean, anything like that can affect our gut. And we know that the gut-brain relationship is so, so strong. So with fiber, it's finding out what you can tolerate. Um, our instinct when we get unwell is diet is the one thing that we can't control. So we'll start kind of going, okay, what will I eat? I'm going to start being really super healthy. I'll start juicing. I'll start doing everything. I start being really, really healthy. And sometimes it's just a little bit too much for our gut to take. And then we may get unpleasant symptoms like bloating or wind or altered bad habits. So it's just working that out to get the balance right. We know that most adults will need an average of 25 grams of fiber a day. So to give you kind of a rough idea, on average, I tend to kind of allocate an average of portion of serving of fruit or a uh, vegetable will give you roughly about three grams of fiber. And a serving is about the size of a tennis ball. So that would be on average, you'll get about roughly three grams of fiber per serving. So if you're having your six a day of your fruit and vegetables, you'll get 18 grams of fiber from those. Then if you're having your potato or any kind of your porridge oats, your brown bread or anything like that, you'll make up the extra kind of seven grams to get that 25 grams of fiber a day. If you're finding your stomach is a little bit unsettled, you may find too much fruit and vegetables doesn't suit you. A good kind of rule of thumb if your stomach is a little bit sensitive is um, almost think about the more work that's done to the food before you eat it, the less work your gut has to do. So you might find softer fruits are easier. Or if your vegetables are really well cooked and soft before you eat them, they're easier to digest than say something that's raw and crunchy. So you might find you have a raw carrot and your stomach doesn't feel 100%, but if you have a cooked carrot, it's okay. And that just might be where your stomach is at that time. Okay, and it's just to kind of really listen to your body and not try and push it too much. Um, likewise, you know, we notice sometimes if people eat an apple, an apple is a classic one that can cause a little bit of windy pains. But if people grate the apple, first of all, or if they've maybe cooked it into a compost, their stomach is okay. So it's just kind of taking some of the work away from the gut um, initially. So with fibre, we actually call it um, the, uh, the gut's natural sleeping brush. That's a little dietitian term that we tend to refer to. And the idea is, is that fibre actually slows the movement down of things through the gut. So it slows the movement down, which means your body has more time to absorb the nutrients. And it has more time than the, the stool has more time to absorb the negative kind of byproducts that, that we want to get rid of for it to move through the gut slowly. So it's not actually to help increase the transit time, it helps slow it down to make sure we get the most out of things. I think that's enough to talk about uh, stools at the moment, so I'll move on. Um, 
phytochemicals. Most of you may have heard of phytochemicals because when you Google things or do any research on nutrition, this, this term will come up. And the easiest way to explain a phytochemical is it's something naturally present in a food that gives it its characteristic color or taste or flavor. So um, for example, garlic, like the, the phytochemical in garlic is called allicin. Okay, um, and it's actually what is so beneficial for it is the phytochemical. Um, I always use the example actually of broccoli. If you have a, a floret of broccoli and you see it starts to lose some of the green around the kind of outside, that means it's just starting to lose some of its phytochemical content. But it's actually still good for you, so that, you, know, you don't need to discard it, but it's just it's the green that's really, really good for it, and that's called proanthocyanin. So when we look at this, the key thing is we talk about eating a rainbow, trying to get as many different colors as possible. And this also kind of, I suppose, links into the idea of supplements versus food. Um, you know, if you take a vitamin A in a supplement, you'll get the vitamin A, you'll get vitamin A from a carrot, but you're also going to get phytochemicals as well and fiber and other nutrients. So we know that greens, we do say to people, try to have something green every single day. Okay, and that's for folate, and folate is really, really important for us. But um, also, it just it has the, the greens have so many different phytochemicals, and they're so beneficial. And basically, phytochemicals help a plant grow, and when we eat them, we get the beneficial effects of it too. If your stomach is a little bit sensitive, easier green vegetables on your digestion would be things like courgette, green beans, well cooked broccoli, spinach. Um, cucumber, uh, peas can be okay, um, and things like leeks might be a little bit windy, potentially asparagus can be a little bit funny sometimes, but if your stomach is fine, it doesn't matter what color you go for. Um, orange and kind of orangey colored vegetables tend to be, uh, they, have a, they have beta carotene in them, which when our body eats it converts to vitamin A, and vitamin A really helps support the immune system. Vitamin A is involved in kind of uh, creating a really strong structure, a tissue structure to help form like a, a really good barrier. So vitamin A rich foods are really, really good to support our immune system. So trying to have something orange, kind of a red related to the day can be a really good idea. And then um, the red and purpley kind of ones, they have anthocyanins in them, which are really good on lycopenes, but they also tend to be highest in vitamin C. But a random fact is that uh, kiwis are the highest in vitamin C, but we usually get enough vitamin C even in one or two pieces of fruit or veg a day. It's really the phytochemicals and all the other elements we want to get from all our different colours. I actually spoke to my youngest child's class last week, where we set them a project of trying to eat a rainbow in the idea of getting them used to having the different colours in the day. With fats, so fats have been, talk about an, a, a food group that have gone through being absolutely hated to then embraced and still feared by some, but now people think we should be all eating fats. And fats are kind of very much as those in vogue, we would say at the moment. Um, and with fats, we no longer talk about good or bad fats, okay? So when I was in college, we were taught about good and bad fats. We don't do that anymore because we actually need each of the individual fats in our diet and it's getting the balance right. So my next slide looks a little bit sciencey, but it actually um, it kind of explains the different fats quite well. So we have saturated fats, which would be hard at room temperature. And it is estimated that we need roughly about even 10% of our calories to come from these. So, you know, I use butter at home. I don't buy low fat dairy. I would buy full fat dairy because First of all, there's so little difference between full fat and low fat. But secondly, you know, there's nothing wrong with these fats. We can have these fats in our diet. And even when I meet somebody who says following a vegan diet and they have no animal proteins in their diet, I will encourage them to use coconut oil because it's a saturated fat and we do need about 10% of our calories to come from that group. Unsaturated fats will tend to be liquid at room temperature. Okay, so that's the kind of main difference. The monounsaturates, which would be your kind of typically the olive oil, avocado, nuts, we want predominantly most of our calories to come from there. So the 12 by 12 to 15 percent of our calories to come from there. And they are ones that are, you know, have the heart health benefits. And I mean the Mediterranean diet is continuously pitched as one of the healthiest diets in the world. So it would be one that we want people to use that. Um, and then your polyunsaturates would be kind of your omega-6 and your omega-3. 
So omega-6, we tend to have plenty of in the Irish diet. And omega-3 is what we call an anti-inflammatory fat. And it's in your oily fish. So if you like fish, having a fish twice a week in the diet is a, a good idea. Um, and if you're not keen on fish, a plant source of omega-3 would be particularly the highest, like walnuts are the highest in omega-3. Chia seeds are particularly high in omega-3. Um, so it, I would recommend anyone then to have a plant source of omega-3 in their diet every single day. Because if your body is under any stress in terms of any infection or sickness, disease, anything like that, there will be an inflammatory response in your body and you want to try and get more anti-inflammatory foods into the diet to help with that. Um, about six walnuts a day is enough to meet your omega-3 requirements. And the walnuts also have the benefit of being very easy on the stomach, but they're also quite expensive. So you need to kind of to balance it out. Chia seeds would be very, very good as well. Um, I have sunshine. I want to talk about vitamin D today because obviously it's been quite topical recently. Um, it's topical for, for all of us because we're Irish, okay? So anybody in Ireland tends to need to take the 10 micrograms of vitamin D every day. We do get vitamin D from sunlight between uh, March and October, between the hours of 12 and 3. And because we have had such beautiful weather recently, our vitamin D, we will be getting vitamin D. If you were anything higher than factor eight, we don't tend to absorb it as much. So the advice would be, you know, you can expose your hands, you know, kind of for even 10 minutes every day, you'll get some vitamin D there. And then you want to put your sun protection and protect your skin. Um, there's other evidence recently linking uh, how vitamin D helps reduce the risk of respiratory um, infections. And that's actually not new. That has been in research for a number of years now looking at that and something recently was was uh, published about it. So at the moment, I mean, I am taking, personally, I take, I take uh, vitamin D every day because I'm an asthmatic and I am going out for my walk every day and, you know, I get some light. But it's one of those things um, in winter year, in winter months, we definitely encourage people to take it. And in summer months, if you're getting outside every day, you may not need it. But dietary sources are very hard to come by. So you do have some of our functional milks, like our, we have milks that have vitamin D added to them. Some breakfast cereals have vitamin D added to them. Um, mackerel would be the highest in it. So if you like mackerel, having that once a week maybe could be a good idea. And eggs have about one microgram per egg. So there you get little bits in, in food, but it's really, really hard to get enough through food alone. So we do rely either on a supplement or um, sunlight. Um, and it is perfectly safe to take, say, 10 micrograms a day with sunlight to get plenty okay so it is one that's very topical at the moment um, so i thought we have to talk about sugar because it's one that comes up hugely in discussion in relation to i suppose nutrition and cancer and and inflammation and overall health so definitely we know that there was a period of time where we were eating too much sugar probably as a knock-on effect from when we demonized fat in the 80s and 90s we ended up eating too much sugar. So it's trying to get that balance right. And I suppose we need to be a little bit careful that we don't do the same thing to sugar that we did to fat in the 80s and end up eating too much of something else. So to get that balance. The advice would be that we want um, less than kind of 10% or less of our calories to come from added or they're called uh, free sugars. So an added or a free sugar would be something that is added into the food. So it would be sugar, it could be honey, agave, nectar, coconut sugar, it doesn't matter what name it has, like the body doesn't really care sugar is sugar. So when it comes to that, we would be talking about, yeah, we want people to limit their intake of sugary drinks um, and to excess sugar in the diet. But it is still okay to have about 10% of your calories to come from a free sugar. So for example, if like most of the Irish population at the moment are doing a bit more home baking or anything like that at the moment, you may be having something with a little sugar in it every day, that's okay, as long as the rest of your diet is healthy. What it doesn't include is sugars uh, that are naturally present in fruit, like fructose, and it does not include lactose that is naturally present in milk. And that was the one concern that we've had is that people with demonizing sugar suddenly take everything out. They feel like they can't have any sugar in the diet, and then they start reducing their intake of fruit or dairy for the reason of avoiding sugar. Um, and we don't need to do that. Um, also, I'd come across people who are, you would start buying more expensive sugars like coconut sugar or agave nectar or very kind of, you know, different alternatives. And it doesn't, the body doesn't not going to differentiate whether it's 
a granulated sugar or a coconut sugar, it doesn't really alter it very, very differently. It's still, a, it's still not a sugar. So it would just be a case of a personal choice of whichever you want to go for. Um, glucose is the body's main source of fuel. So all our cells in the body use glucose as a source of fuel. Our brain uses about six grams per hour of glucose. And uh, it's what the body uses quite efficiently as a fuel source. So yes, it is true that a cancer cell will use glucose but so will every other cell in your body. And if it doesn't have glucose, it may use something else instead. So it's one of those things that it, there's a lot of talk about how sugar may feed cancer cells, and it's, it's not as straightforward as that. But what we, we do know is if someone's diet historically was very high in sugar, they tend to have a low fiber intake. And if they have a low high sugar and a low fiber intake, they tend to maybe be more um, at risk of being overweight. And we do know if you're overweight, it's a risk factor for certain cancers. So the correlation and more kind of comes along that pathway than the actual nutrient. Um, when you're not feeling well, sometimes you might find that, you know, you can't tolerate as much fiber. You have to listen to what your body wants. But we would say trying to keep the less than about 10% of your calories to be coming from a free or an added sugar. So then portion size, what is right? So the best thing I use, I don't like people having to weigh foods or get into anything like that. So I always use the hand, okay? So your stomach is the size of your own fist. And that applies from when you're born right through, okay? So it's even good when you've got kids, if anyone has kids at home, like that's the size of their own fist, it's the size of their own stomach. And it's a good indication for portion sizes. And on average, our stomach can stretch to about four times the size of one fist. So, if you want to give it basic, basically the idea would be your plate is like your hand circumference, okay? So that would be the ideal plate size. I have nice big hands, so I'm lucky. Um, and ideally what you want is your, I would normally say to people, like your, your vegetable portion should be about two fists, roughly. Um, and then the other half of your plate will be your protein and carbohydrates. That was kind of a very simple way of looking at it. But the simple thing to think about is, that's about right like your fist is your stomach so if you look at your plate of food you know what what you can manage if your appetite isn't 100% at the moment and you need to eat more little and often you should definitely be able to manage the amount of a fist okay that's kind of another way of thinking about it um they talk about like the protein being the palm of your hand but then there's a whole thickness thing as well so i was saying earlier on maybe like it's 100 to 120 grams of kind of a, a protein food um, your vegetable can be a fist and you want to have about two of them anyway. Um, fat, they say a thumb. Okay. And carbohydrate serving, they say to be pretty much equal to your protein serving on your plate. That would be kind of the rough, the average rule of thumb. And then I have two plate models here just to give you a rough idea. So if you're trying to kind of lose weight or you're, you're you know, you're trying to kind of drop and just get to back to a healthier zone. Um, we would use the plate that has half the color, I call it half color, so it'd be half your vegetables, a quarter carbohydrate and a quarter protein. If your weight is fine and you want to maintain your weight, or you may even need to increase your weight, um, you would do, um, well, say if you want to maintain your weight, I would do a third, I would divide your plate into a third, a third, a third. So like generally my dinner plate will be a third, a third, a third of protein, carb and color. And if you want to increase your weight, then you would do half carbohydrate, a quarter vegetables, a quarter meat. That would be kind of roughly an idea. Um, and they would be kind of going for like, if you're using baby potatoes, like you eat the skin on them because you get more of your potassium there and more fiber um, and using different kind of grains. Okay, and really getting higher fiber foods there. When you're looking at a snack food, um, a snack we can generally, you know, you want to look at what's got more fiber, more protein. You know, sometimes people look at calories and things, but then you might pick up nuts and go, God, they seem high, but actually nuts are really good for us because they've got fiber, protein, and the good fat. So just like a lot more nutrients is giving you as opposed to the calories, the nutrients are most important. And then less of kind of maybe the saturated fat or salt and sugar. So for example, you know, if I would say to people, is to look at snacks and kind of think, what's it going to give me? So if you're comparing, for example, a packet of crisps versus a bag of popcorn, you might go, well, the popcorn is going to give me fiber, so I should go with that. It just gives you a different element. It could be having, um, like if you have two bars, like people would say, oh, sure, like the same calories in a chocolate bar as in this nutty bar, but the nutty bar is going to give you some nutrition. So look at the, the nutritional value that's going to give you. 
it's really important to differentiate between a snack and a treat. So a snack is something that is part of your daily diet that offers nutrition and is part of your kind of daily nutritional needs. Um, a treat is something that you can enjoy occasionally and it may or may not offer nutrition. Okay, So you know it's okay to have both, but not to differentiate them. So I would do, you know, say to people that like, if you're kind of sometimes, if people are struggling with snacks and they want to know what to do, so well, maybe pick one snack that's going to be colored. So it'll be a fruit, for example, and one snack might be protein. So it might be some nuts or it might be hummus or a nut butter or something along those lines. And then one might be a treat. You know, you might have a treat maybe in the evening time. Um, the 80-20 concept, I think, is really, really important kind of a way to view healthy eating and living. We know that if 80% of your calories are meeting your nutritional requirements, so if your meals basically are quite good and you're having a couple of healthy snacks in a day, you're, you're meeting your requirements for your protein, your fiber, your vitamins, your minerals, you're getting all the nutrition you need, then there's room for 20% of those calories to maybe come from something that you're, you just feel like having. So maybe you've baked banana bread like everybody else has or something like that that you might have something along those lines. So it's like the 80-20 rule. As I normally say, like, it means that, you know, sometimes people talk about like cheat days and things like that. And I don't like that terminology when it comes to food because it implies that you should feel guilty when you have it or it's not good to have. Whereas really, most of us like to have something nice a few times a week and that's okay because if, the, if you look at your week's calories and over your seven days, 80% of your calories have come from good nutritious foods. There's a 20% window there for there to be something more treat-like to have, okay? And I think that's a really important concept for people to be able to have a long-term healthy approach to eating. Um, activity at the moment is something that for some people, people are out walking and they're getting out. For those who are more nervous to go out, they might feel that they don't want to go out. But walking obviously is really good. We're trying to get 30 minutes a day, but what I would say if you're not going out walking is try and even do get fresh air every day, whether it's sitting out in the garden or doing something that you're definitely getting fresh air every day. There's so many different classes online now and YouTube videos and people are really embracing it, but trying to aim for exercise. But you have to take into account your own levels of energy or your tiredness or any of these things that are going on for you that you do, you listen to your body and you do what you can do. It may, you may find that at the moment that three 10 minute walks in a day suits you better than having one 30 minute walk and that's okay. It's trying to listen to your body to see kind of what suits you. Um, Supplements, I said I would kind of touch on because it's something that a lot of people talk about. So generally with supplements, we view them as something that can complement your diet. There are certain ones that have a real part to play. So for example, vitamin D, we spoke about that. For Irish people in particular, anyone who's, who lives kind of in countries um, high in the northern and southern hemisphere would need to think about vitamin D. Um, it's not going to replace food, but it can complement it. And sometimes there can be a push of excessively taking supplements. Or I do often have someone come in to me who might have four or five different kind of bottles of, of different supplements that they're taking. And it's, it's an excessive amount, it's too much. If you're ever under, if you're undergoing treatment, you would always discuss taking vitamins with your tea just to see what the idea would be. Um, sometimes if people like post, say radiotherapy or post different things, we might say like zinc and vitamin C can be good for wound healing, um, like B vitamins, because sometimes B complex can be good for you know energy or there's different things, but you always look at the diet as a whole and just see how it's managing, but they can complement it. And a higher dose doesn't always mean better. You know, your body can only use what it needs. So sometimes if we buy very, very high dose vitamins, we're only actually excreting them, we're getting rid of them because our body doesn't actually need them. Oops, my next one. Like research when it comes to nutrition is quite kind of, there's a few things that we have. We definitely know that increasing our intake of plant-based foods is a good idea. So I normally say to people, if their digestive system is working well, that they would aim to have about 30 kind of different plant-based foods in a diet each week. And that would include your whole grains, fruit, vegetables, but maybe beans, pulses, nuts, foods like that. If beans and pulses are something that you're just like, oh, not really big about them, or I'm not used to the texture of them, because not something a lot of us were brought up with, um, I would say buy them tinned, and you can mash them with the potato masher first before putting them in your food. And that actually even might be a wee bit easier on your digestion, okay? 
Um, the research says five a day of fruit or vegetables, and you now say six, and there's even a push to put that up to even higher. So five or more, definitely. Um, with red meat, it's interesting. So definitely, we, like there, you know, they talk about um, things like salamis and uh, pastrami's and bacon and sausages and foods like that being a kind of a higher a food that we want people to have less of not that you can't have it but that you would not have it in excess so it might be if you're having it once a week that's probably fine but not much more than that um red meat in terms more like a like beef or lamb or kind of um, leaner cuts of meat are lower down the scale so what they say is that there's basically there's less strong evidence but we would still recommend that you kind of keep that 100 gram serving so like you know it will be like a a fillet of steak as opposed to one that would take up half your plate. Um, may, achieving and maintaining a healthy weight is, is a big factor. But I mean, you look at where you are at the moment in your, your journey and to see what's right for you at the moment. Being active and then limiting alcohol consumption is another obviously important factor as well. Okay, so I'm hoping that there's been lots of questions to ask because I've kind of covered different areas but i know there's lots of people might have questions and i want to leave some time and i think i have left 15 minutes so i was perfect okay so if there's any questions there i know helen you might have some for me yeah thank you so much Aveen, for that and um, we've had some lovely comments come through that i must pass on to you oh, great. Thank a lot of people have said that you've been very easy to understand um, which is often, it's a big compliment in terms of diet, isn't it? Diet can be so complex for people. I think people overcomplicate and I'll stop sharing my screen so people don't just see the big, so my mouse is not acting up. <clears throat> I can just stop share. There we go. Great. Yeah, so we've had some lovely comments and I think, you know, it, it, it actually complements how you deliver um, your, your program um, because people do need to understand it. Mm. You know, I find that people who, who are in cancer treatment or even have come out the other side of treatment often find um, it quite complex to follow and deal with. So, um, so that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'll open up the Q&A now and we'll see how we're getting on. I'm, I've got them coming from lots of different angles. OK, so. Um, our first question here from Roseanne is, hi, I have been put into the menopause as part of my treatment. I struggle to keep a healthy weight. My weight keeps increasing. It is very hard to lose. I have sore joints, so impact exercise is not really available to me. Also, what foods are good for joints? Okay, so hi, Roseanne. Um, I suppose that would be quite common for people, isn't it, that the, they would be pushed into early menopause. Uh, first things to do would be to, remember I was pointing out the kind of looking at your protein and fiber combination. So sometimes we know that optimal protein is definitely one we really start to focus on post-menopause and making sure that you're having a protein kind of food, you know, three to four meals a day. Okay, and then looking at the fiber as well. In terms of the joints, omega-3 would be really, really important and magnesium is really important for joints. So magnesium would be, um, a good rule of thumb is the, the stronger the green a vegetable, the more magnesium it has. That's a good rule of thumb. It can be sometimes even a good idea even to take a magnesium if you're having joint issues. Um, how you work out is, uh, it's 2.5 milligrams of magnesium per pound body weight. So you can actually work out what your dose is for you. And it can sometimes help. And you can also get topical magnesium that can actually help. Um, so the key thing is keeping the hydration, getting the protein and fiber balanced, and then looking at omega-3. In terms of exercise, the one I always recommend for people who are going to menopause is things like Pilates and yoga because they're not joint, they're not difficult on the joints, but they really help focus the core. And unfortunately, when you post menopause, that's where the, the weight tends to go on the tummy. So they can be really good. And the kind of, once you get used to that, it really helps the flexibility because it, it can be quite sore and seize up almost. And the more you seize up, you, the less you do, and it becomes a knock on effect. So hopefully that might help. But really? it's a very common one, yeah. There's actually one probiotic that can be very good. I'm not allowed to give the recommend one brand, so I'm trying to think how to do it. I might tell you, Helen, afterwards. Okay. Yeah, pass it on. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so we have another one here from Eileen. I continue to lose weight no matter what I eat. Add full fat milk and cream to dishes as suggested. Everyone says I look great, but I don't see the same image. 
in my dreams years ago, I would, I would have loved to show off my size eight figure. Now I see a skeleton and don't look and don't like to look in the mirror. Any dietary advice, welcome. Yeah, so the key thing there is to, is to look at increasing um, carbohydrate service, carbohydrate portions. So snacking would be like carbohydrates are the one kind of fuel that if we have more than we need, we'll put into storage. Okay, so um, like using the cream and things like that can be beneficial, but it doesn't tend to work as much on weight gain as we would have previously thought. Um, other thing I would use would be um, fortified foods. So I would often recommend for people uh, things like even Ovaltine and, you know, Nesquik that are fortified, but you can make them up with the milky drink. So they don't fill you up too much, but they're giving you all the vitamins and minerals you need as well as the protein. And sometimes what I use is skimmed nut powder, which you can buy in the supermarket. One tablespoon gives you 11 grams of protein and 100 calories. So you could add that to your milk for the day or add that to a soup or something. And again, or your mashed potato, and it's bringing up the calories about the volume of food so you don't feel too full. So, yeah, little and often and up in the carbs. Yeah. Okay, so the next one is anonymous. Avian, you are great. Thank you so much for this. I am very intolerant. We don't know who that is. I am very intolerant. How do I keep up my calcium levels? Yeah, so um, it depends whether it's milk protein intolerant or lactose intolerant. If it's lactose intolerant, you could try a lacto-free milk and hard cheeses are naturally lactose free. Also goat's milk can be useful because it's about 25% roughly lower in lactose than regular cow's milk. So that could, that be, a, that could be one option. If your um, is milk protein is the issue, um, soya milk is the most nutritionally equivalent to cow's milk in terms of absorbing the calcium. But then sometimes people are nervous of soya milk depending on the type of cancer they've had. So you could then, I would probably, if you want, if you're nervous of soya milk, I would then probably go for your almond or oat milk or one of those. And um, you could, I and I would take a supplement with it. So I'd either go, if it's lactose, try the lacto-free milk. <clears throat> if it's, if you're comfortable having the soya, I would use a soya milk alternative, or then I would go with the plant milk and have a supplement. You can get small amounts of calcium from things like nuts and vegetables, but the amount you have to eat to get enough calcium, is just, you know, it's easier to take a supplement. If you're taking a supplement, just before I forget, what we now know is it should be a ratio of two to one of calcium to magnesium. So make sure that the calcium supplement has calcium, magnesium, and vitamin D. Great. Okay, we have a lot of questions here, Avian. I'm not sure we'll get to get through them all, but if we don't get through them, we will answer them on a frequently answered, uh, asked questions online. Yeah. So I have another one here from Liz. Thanks, Avian, for a great webinar. What is your advice for juicing and making soups rather than eating the fruit and veg directly? Um, soups, I think, are great because with soups, we don't, I know we kind of, we don't tend to lose as much of the nutrition in soup, so, and there's no sugar in a vegetable. So soups can be very, very useful. And, you know, a, a bowl of soup will give you about two of your servings for a day, okay? And I think also they can be very useful if your appetite's not great, or, you, you know, if you're watching calories or anything like that, there's a really nutritious way to have food. Juices, it depends on what you put in them. So it's always best to have the, the fruit as a whole, um, a smoothie, you're still getting some of the fiber, but with the juice, you get no fiber, but you do get a lot of the vitamins. So it's not that there's anything wrong with it, it's just a lot of vitamins. So mm -hmm. I would say when people are juicing is to try and maybe juice vegetables and maybe add one fruit for sweetness. Mm -hmm. And then you're not getting as much sugar, but you're getting the vitamins. So it could be, you know, apple, spinach, and then um, celery, something like that. But usually you need to add some fruit for a little bit of sweetness with it. And if you're able to drink just vegetable juices, I think respect because I couldn't, <laughs> but it could be fine. But it's one of those things, it's not a bad thing to do, but I mean, it is probably technically better to get it from your whole fruit or veg. Okay. Um, question from Eileen, struggling with smells of certain foods that I once loved, i.e. broccoli. Any tips for other ingredients that mask smell? Tried the stock cube, but not killing it enough. Yeah, it's, it's a really common one that happens actually for people. So often it's actually um, using herbs or spices. So things like chives or parsley. Parsley is really good for absorbing flavor. Uh, sorry, not flavor, smell. So um, if you put parsley in with the food, sometimes it can help. Um, whereas, um, and it depends on how you cook it. 
So sometimes roasting uh, broccoli, for example, it doesn't give as much smell. And then if you add parsley to it, the parsley can help absorb some of the odor. But um, if, if you boil a vegetable or use moisture in boiling a vegetable, you'll get more smell than you will if you roast it. Like a big try, yeah. <clears throat> I've had a message come in there on from one of our ladies with metastatic breast cancer saying wonderful speaker. So they're all very, very pleased and impressed with you, Aileen. Um, the next question, there's two to get, there's two here actually, I'll put them together. So what are the best foods for vitamin D? Um, and do you recommend that everyone who take a vitamin D supplement? My daughter has, is asthmatic and seems to get a lot of chest infections in spite of eating healthy diet and being active. As an asthmatic myself, I take vitamin D all year round. Um, I always do, and I, I actually do think it has reduced my, because I used to get three or four bad infections a year, whereas now I might get one, one okay, case or touch wood. Um, so um, I would take it every year, and it, just because I've been looking at the research over the last couple of years now, I mean, the Department of Health are still saying the 10 micrograms a day. In my view, I think that may, may change Okay, but um, it would be an idea to go with. Vitamin D from foods and mushrooms are the only vegetables that have vitamin D. They have a tiny amount in them, okay? Um, eggs would have, so one microgram of vitamin D in one egg, roughly. Um, about 100 grams of mackerel will give you 16 micrograms of vitamin D, so it's highest. Oily fish will give you a little small amount, maybe one or two micrograms, other ones. Um, and then your fortified foods. But it's interesting, I remember talking to one uh, company, I think it was, I can't remember which one it was. There was a cereal, it was a low sugar cereal, high fiber and added vitamin D, but they were saying people used, would take low fat milk with it. And then low, you need fat to absorb vitamin D, so then they wouldn't absorb it from the cereal. So there's all these different things to think about. But it's hard to get it from food alone. Really hard, mostly. But any, any asthmatic, if I have any asthmatic patient, I tell them to take it. Um, somebody, um, Arian just uh, chatted in there to say thank you very much for answering her question. So um, a few more questions here. This, these are around dietary supplements, Avine. So uh, there's two here together again that I'll ask. Um, so would you recommend taking dietary supplements while staying home, cocooning to help balance the diet as fresh fruit and vegetable doesn't always last the full week? And also, is it okay for me to take supplements while on chemo? Can they interact negatively with my treatment? Okay, so if you're cocooning at home, I mean, there's no harm taking a multivitamin. Like, it's not going to do any harm. And I probably would go for, like, a, you know, one that just kind of, like, you know, there's, like, Multibionta or the Centrum or I just kind of think there's different, but Cal can do one. You know, one that just gives you, like, 100%. It's almost like an insurance policy just to kind of complement what you're doing. Or even Baraka can be actually quite useful because it's one, you know, if they're, your hydration or recharge, there's a few different brands of them. Um, when you're on chemo, I'd always check with your pharmacist. Because I know when I worked in the hospital, some of my consultants I worked with were fine with people taking supplements and some weren't. So I'd always check with the pharmacist to see if there's any interaction or any kind of counter interaction that they should worry about. Um, there usually isn't, you know, for say a multivitamin, it is usually fine, but it's worth checking it just to be sure. But I think there's no harm taking in like a regular multivitamin just to complement, you know what I mean? Just while you're doing this, just to kind of, even uh, for ease to know you're getting everything you need. Um, there's a popular one here, Avian, on juicing um, for, for someone with metastatic breast cancer or even outside of that. What is your, what is your? Um, it would be juicing, I would say, it's not a necessity, but there's nothing wrong with doing it. And it can be a real bolus of getting in vitamins. So for people taking like, you know, if you're juicing a lot of green vegetables and you might add, kiwi can go well with, uh, with them, green vegetables and kiwis are highest in vitamin C, for example or like apple or pear can be nice sweeter ones to go in with them. But something like that, you can just get a real bolus of vitamins to kind of start your day, which can be quite a good thing you know, to do. But if you're eating your veg, if you're eating your six a day, it's not a necessity. So there's no right or wrong answer to it. I think it's quite a personal choice. It's not something I tend to recommend people to do, but if people do- Losing you a little bit there, Aideen. Losing me to you, on my back. You're back now. <laughs> um, it's something that if someone's doing it, I wouldn't tell them to stop doing it necessarily, but I wouldn't recommend for people to start out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, have you time for a couple more questions there, Avi? No, I'm fine. Uh, so during my treatment, I became very constipated due to medication and regardless of my diet. 
what is your, your advice to counteract this? So the, I would take chia seeds or linseeds are really good to help because they're actually, linseed are actually a cotton. So they absorb fluid and they soften the stool. So one tablespoon of those can be quite useful. Also, if you're, if it's, you're not in treatment and it's okay, magnesium oxide, no, magnesium citrate. Oh my God, I've got the right one. Yes, magnesium citrate um, supplements can help. So taking 250 milligrams of magnesium citrate can actually help soften the stool. Um, and that can be quite effective. So I would normally say to people is to take the seeds and try the, the magnesium. To see what that. Again. Okay, we lost you there for a little bit, Avian. Oh, so the magnesium citrate, chia seed and linseed would be the ones. I say not trying to add too much fiber in because then you'll end up getting windy and bloated and it becomes more difficult. Okay, um, Avian, there are lots more questions there. We're probably not going to be able to get through them, but we will answer them and put them up on our frequently asked questions. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, I suppose there's one thing that I'd like to ask you, Avian, before we go, and it really is about demystifying the myths that are out there around diet and cancer. Um, we come across it a lot, and I know it's really important to promote evidence-based yeah. um, research around diet and cancer. What would be your main message um, to our listeners this morning? Um, the main thing would be when you read something or see something, is kind of look like where was it published, okay? Like, was there any sponsorship? Like, was it paid for? What qualifications does the person have who's doing it? So quite often, like, there might be somebody medical saying something about food and nutrition and they, they don't have the expertise in diet and research or it could be someone who has no medical qualifications who's done a bit of research but they haven't been taught it. so look at the source of the information look where it's published you know how many people were in the study um did it prove the cause or was an association because causation doesn't mean you know it doesn't like if i tell everybody to eat an apple every day for the next month does that and they don't go to the doctor does that mean having an apple day to have to go to the doctor. You know, you can't, we don't know for certain. Food studies are really, really hard to do because of the food matrix. Mm -hmm. And you have to look at the whole lifestyle as a whole. So honestly, I would say often if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, okay? Um, what food can do is, the main thing we know that does increase risk factor for say cancers would be being overweight um, and having very high consum consumption of very processed meats and you know or excess sugar in our diet or anything like that because they all if you're if they're, those are in your diet too much you tend to be overweight so is it the weight or is it the food we don't know mm -hmm. so i think the main thing is probably to try and not overthink it and um, no one's diet is 100 percent perfect okay none of like none of us are 100 percent perfect we all do our best but none of us are 100 percent perfect so is to try and not overthink it that there's you know there is no such thing as a good or a bad food it only is how it fits into your diet. And I think that's the most important thing because the anxiety I see around food is huge. And I would see that my role as a dietitian when I first qualified would have been around more nutrition education and, you know, at the beginning, whereas now I spend more time reassuring people about their diet than telling them what to eat. Like my role has completely changed. Yeah. Um, so, Avian, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that for now. Okay. Um, um, I'd like to thank you from the Marie Keating Foundation so much for your expertise and the vibes we're getting from the audience is that they really, really enjoyed and understood um, your presentation. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for asking me. It's delighted to do it. Yeah. We'll check in again very soon. So I just like, there's a couple more slides I have here that I'd like to, um, I suppose, share. Sorry, I have to flick through them now. So I suppose there's some important uh, websites that we'd like to mention, our own one, the Marie Keating Foundation. And for all of those of you who have not had questions answered today, um, Aileen is, is, has very gratefully um, um, agreed to answer those questions and we'll put them up on our website for you. Um, the Indy website is there and DNC. And we also have breakthrough um, cancer research. Again, Avian, I know you would you would actually support uh, these books. Um, yeah, they're brilliant. They're really good. Yeah. So they're excellent. I'll just show you the books. So there's healthy eating for cancer survivors, 
Uh, there's good nutrition for cancer recovery, particularly for people who are actually recovering from chemotherapy treatments and radiotherapy treatments. Um, and then there's specific books on, on you know, nourishing your body for pancreatic cancer treatment um, and for those with swallowing difficulties, which can be extremely difficult. So um, this is a good uh, guide as well, Eat Well Guide. It's the plate guide, which Avian has talked about. And also the food pyramid, which is very well known. Avian has alluded to this in her presentation too, and it's the food pyramid of Ireland that again, we should all be familiar with in terms of our holistic approach to diet and maintaining a healthy weight. Um, so we've done our questions and answers. Thank you very much, Avian, for that. Um, and I'm going to leave you now, but just with a couple of, um, I suppose, ideas of how you can help us. So please do sign up for our newsletter. Um, and keep up to date with what the Marie Keating Foundation are doing. We are going through very turbulent times as a, as a charity, like many others, um, and our fundraising activities have ceased um, because it, we cannot hold events at the moment. Do please stay connected to our um, cancer and COVID wellness webinars. Um, um, and if you'd like to do a coffee morning or anything um, in aid of the foundation, please do that. Um, and there's also a donate button. So thank you very much for your time. Um, and tune in with us next week for part two of our six week webinar. Um, and Avian, thank you and all the best. Okay, thank you.